και καλησπέρα σα. Ε, Καλώ ήρθατε απόψε στο σεμινάριο. Ε, ονομάζομαι Ροζαλία Νικολάου. Είμαι και εγώ ε, μέλο τη Επιτροπή που διοργανώνει τα φετινά σεμινάρια. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Ros Nicolai, for those who don't know me, and I'm also a member of the organising committee for this year's Greek History and Culture um, Seminars. Can you hear me at the back? Yes? You heard that, didn't you? Okay, we've got a few um, housekeeping announcements. Um, first of all, the committee has decided to rotate the role of the presenter so that you can all get to meet us and if you've got any questions, you can direct your queries to each and every one of us and we'd be only too happy to assist you with your queries. Um, secondly, uh, there is a lecture swap. Um, on Thursday the 22nd of March, we had programmed um, uh, Professor Andrew Benjamin's lecture on uh, law and life in ancient Greek thought and that will be swapped with the lecture on uh, Thursday, the 26th of April, which is Mr. Amenitidis' lecture on Antigone by Sophocles. So, can you note those changes in your diaries? We will update the website in due course, and I think I saw a notice in the lift as well. And one more thing. I've just been handed this. And uh, if you're all invited to a book launch, um, and it says here, this is our promised land. It's written by Olympia Bezaitis and Maria Costas, a fellow committee member, um, will launch the book on Sunday the 1st of April from 1 to 3 p.m. at the Philanthropic Society of Kalonevi Kozanis. I've never been there, sorry. 81 Atherton Road, Oakley. So grab one of these if you can. And it's the promised land. Okay. Here's a little bit about tonight's speaker, <coughs> who hails from Monash University. Dr. Evangelina Magnostilatidis began her studies in Greece at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. She continued them in the United Kingdom at the Universities of Leeds and Kent, then worked for a few years in the United Kingdom before coming to Australia. Her area of expertise is Greco-Roman literature and ritual and its interaction with the ancient Near Eastern societies, especially during the Hellenistic period. Her presentation is entitled From Aeschylus to Olympia or Zeus's Transformation, which you have in your handouts. The lecture will deal with the representation of Zeus as the new harsh tyrant of the gods who relies on his attendancy and kratos in order to establish his supremacy over the other gods. Now I've got a whole spiel here about the lecture and you've got that too so I'm not going to go on anymore. So without further ado I introduce to you Dr. Evangelina and Agostu Latidis. Please welcome her. of you that speak Greek will realize that there is no name such as Evangelina. That was, I know, the Philippine website got it wrong years ago and I can't get Monash people to change it, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Eva will do. Okay. Uh, today we'll talk about Aeschylus, from Aeschylus to Olympia or Zeus's uh, transformation. And I hope that Zeus is going to provide the connection between Aeschylus and the work of Prometheus Bound, his play Prometheus Bound, and Olympia and Zeus's representation of the sculptures uh, of his temple there. Okay. I tried to be clever with the PowerPoint. We'll see how it goes. A little bit louder. Do you want to speak louder? If I am too loud, just let me know. The basic point of today's lecture is basically how literature and art in ancient Greece can negotiate and promote certain political messages. To do that, we'll split the talk in two parts. In the first part, I'll talk a little bit about tragedy, its origins and how it was considered as having important educational value, especially under the democracy. 
I will then present to you Prometheus Vinctus, Prometheus Bound, in Aeschylus, and the character of Zeus in that particular play. The point of the first part is that Zeus was originally a god of tyrants that had to be accommodated when the regime changed at Athens and democracy started forming. The second part will focus, will take us all the way to ancient Olympia and the temple of Zeus there. We'll see how agonistic ideals were celebrated at Olympia from a very early stage, right from the uh, foundation of the site, and we'll see archaeological support for democratic Athens and its, its interaction with the temple. How Jews during the democratic period at Athens acquired a new profile at Olympia as well. Bottom line, both Aeschylus in his play and Olympia in the sculptures it acquired after the Athenian victory against the Persians tell the story of harsh tyranny that can nevertheless become perfect rule. It's the story of political maturation in other words. Let's start with the educational value of Greek drama. The origin of Greek, of, of Greek drama, most of you know, dates all the way to the 6th century, back to the 6th century BC, where choral performances uh, involving dancing and singing in honor of Dionysus were organized at local, at local festivals. You have to assume, to imagine them as carnival-like um, events, where dancers uh, would often wear goat skins uh, in order to um, assimilate the sacred animal of the god, the goat. That's where we take the name tragedy from. It's a song in honor of the goat, or, or, so that it makes a little bit more sense, it's a song that tries to honor the goat god. Later on, of course, performances uh, more organized, far more organized at the great Dionysia at Athens, take place in honor of the very god. It would be a remission not to mention Thespis uh, and his contribution to the creation, to the forming, to the shaping of tragedy. Thespis is the one that changed those early hymns, those dithyrams, to songs. He had choruses in the songs, but there was also an interval of prose. And during that prose interval, actors came in and acted an important adventure of one of the heroes or heroines. That's when the tragedy starts taking the form that we recognize it with from the classical period. Still, the whole event is in honor of Dionysus. It is important at this stage to know that tragedy starts with the masses rather than with the nobility. It's an expression of the masses at a time where powerful tyrants have the control of the early city-states in, in Greece, or the early communities that later on transform into city-states. <coughs> if you, for example, have in mind Pindar and his odes dedicated to important victories of tyrants and uh, other nobles, uh, how brilliant uh, they were at Olympia, when we come to tragedy, you think of the simple people that simply look for an excuse to have fun. Interesting, when the democracy takes hold at Athens, tragedy becomes, from a vehicle of expression of the masses, a mainstream means of educating them about political and social issues. <clears throat> Here you see a few early masks made of clay. Rather scary. Drama, in the way that we understand it nowadays, and it's more familiar to us, is created from the time of Aeschylus. He is the one that added the second act of, and from that time on he created the possibility not just of one person that interacts, has a dialogue with a chorus, but there is a potential of conflict <coughs> between the two uh, dialogicians. 
Sophocles adds a third actor. He creates uh, a chorus of 15 members rather than 12 that we had until then. And of course, introduces scenery. By the time of Euripides, you have amazing paintings uh, in the background of tragedies. And important painters of the period, of the classical period, such as Polygnotus, uh, offering their service uh, to, uh, to the playwrights. By the radical period of the democracy under Pericles, you have important performances staged, of course, at the great theater of Dionysus. You have a few pictures of it here, a few images of it here. At the hill, at the slopes of the hill of the Acropolis. And it's an important civic <coughs> event. No longer just an opportunity for having fun and allowing energy to be released, citizens regard it as an important date in the calendar where they will go and hear an account from their politicians and important social and political issues being debated. The festival uh, took place uh, at March, and we know that as many as 15,000 people would attend it, and even prisoners were allowed uh, from their bonds temporarily uh, in order to, uh, to attend the performances. Even the poorest of them had access to, uh, to the site, to the spectacle, and of course, rich citizens vied with each other uh, for, for the sponsorship of the event. One thinks that would be nice nowadays to happen. In that important, compact, socio-political message that was conveyed, you had four sub-events, four dramas, sorry, three dramas, accompanied by a satire play. The sequence allowed for tension to be built before people could relax a little bit with a comic take on the serious issues that were debated in the three uh, dramatic uh, plays. I suspect that most of you are already familiar with that, but again, it would be an omission not to mention Aristotle. So exactly, other than just hearing or debating what were the important issues of the day, what were the spectators trying to get out of the tragedy? And according to Aristotle, they were trying to achieve emotional catharsis. They were there to be moved intentionally to feel pity and fear about important mythological figures, figures that were not perfectly good, neither perfectly bad, figures to whom they could relate to an extent, therefore they would be suitable means for expressing their own agonies and their own concerns, and by <coughs> witnessing how unintentionally or because of a single tragic flaw the character would come to ruins and be utterly in pieces just in front of their eyes, they would engage, they would empathize with the character. Having witnessed this destruction on stage, they would live with ideas of reflection and ideas that life is a terrible thing, it happens to all, so their own woes were just part of this cycle that didn't leave even great heroes untouched, unafflicted. When we come to analyze Prometheus Vintus, you need to think, who is the protagonist in Prometheus Vintus and in Prometheus Bam? Prometheus. And what is Prometheus known for? Well, the one thing that he's known from mythology is that his consistent support toward humanity. But that is the very thing that Zeus charges him with. His love for man is excessive, is too much for the gods to bear, and therefore he has to be punished. Already you start thinking, well, hang on a minute, if Zeus is the leader of the pantheon, <coughs> and if he receives worship in every Greek city, especially at Athens, how come is he so anti-human? If you delve into his mythology a little bit more, you'll see that on a couple of occasions, he was really quite happy with wiping out the whole of humanity. So, the same kind of tension was felt by the ancient worshippers, especially when 
monarchy at Athens was replaced with democracy. How can a democracy worship an absolute monarch, a harsh monarch that is ready to punish not just mortals, but also their champion Prometheus at any given opportunity? This is Aristotle's view of tragedy in his own words, or rather, translated from his own words. Pity is aroused, he tells us, by unmerited misfortune, fear by the misfortune of a man like ourselves. There remains then the character between these two extremes, that of a man who is not eminently good and just, yet whose misfortune is brought about not by vice or depravity, but by some error or frailty. With this rather long introduction, I just didn't want to leave any gaps in the analysis as well, we come to study Aeschylus and Prometheus Bound. Now, Aeschylus is regarded as the first tragedian, the first that really gave tragedy its shape. His style is often understood as archaic, his Greek is difficult, rigid, and it represents the period his period, the archaic period. It's not the elegant Greek you come across by the time of Sophocles. It's not the irreverent Greek, both in terms of language and in terms of ideas, that you see in Euripides. He lives from 525 to 456 BCE. That's an important period historically and politically. It's a time that Athens witnesses tyranny in the faces of the Pisistratids. Pisistratus, the father, and his two sons. It has been suggested that Aeschylus represents Zeus as a terrible tyrant that is to be condemned precisely because he shares with his fellow citizens that experience, the experience of the tyranny that needs to be expelled. Before we conclude that, yes, this is the case, let's take things uh, step by step. From the 18th century onward, modern scholars, contemporary scholars, started casting doubt on the authenticity of Prometheus' bound. That was never negotiated, that was never doubted in antiquity. The play is included under the name of Aeschylus, both in the Pinnacles of Callimachus and in catalogues we have from the library at the museum uh, at Alexandria. What brought about this doubt? For encyclopedic information, it's important to know that even nowadays, in scholarly circles, the authenticity of Prometheus bound is doubted, but that has nothing to do with the content we rather focus on metrical uh, differences and dramatic techniques. I feel, however, that for the most part, this is just a resonance of the 18th century debates that shouldn't be there at all, because, well, I think I have the solution to the theological debate that was first traced in Prometheus Vinctus and caused the whole authenticity problem. First and foremost, we should remember that if we regard Prometheus Bound as a single tragedy, then it's problematic. But if we regard it as part of a trilogy that involves Prometheus Pirphoros, the light bearer, and Prometheus Leomenos, unbound Prometheus, then it has a place. It's less easy to doubt its organic connection to the other two plays, and it's more difficult to cast doubt on its authenticity. Nevertheless, let's have a look at the original theological debate that started the whole issue. The problem was precisely what I mentioned before, that Jews is a really bad character in Prometheus Bound that ought to be rejected, Yet at the same time, in other plays of his, later in his career, Aeschylus seems to 
cast him um, as a just God, a holder of justice, a God that ought to be revered above all others. So how is this? How could the very same person write about a bad God and then the same God in another place can be brilliant? Surely it must be another person or Aeschylus had serious personality issues, <laughs> which I think is not the case. Let's see how Zeus is portrayed as a bad character in Prometheus Bound. First of all, he is mentioned as a tyrant time and again. Not a king, a tyrant. The title of king, was, which is honorific, is particularly reserved for his father Cronos. Cronos is a king, and Cronos is related with a brilliant golden age. The minute Zeus takes on power, at least according to Hesiod, the Iron Age begins, the deterioration of a uh, human race uh, begins, and true to his promises, Zeus proves to be a bad leader. He is accompanied by powerful entities such as Via, force, and Kratos, power. But it is absolute power, imposing power, tyrannical power. To further highlight the point, and a point that surely the ancient audience would have picked up, Zeus is often analyzed in terms of his huge wealth, all the wealth of the earth, gold and diamonds and bronze, he has for himself. He keeps for himself, hidden from humans and the other gods. By that time, by the 5th century, there was a strong tradition that associated greediness, avarice, with uh, the tyrants and their tendency to just grab and steal whatever they wanted. So, again, Zeus is represented in really oblique colors as a god that didn't deserve to be the leader, you know, the king of heavens, the leader of the other gods, not to mention the father of gods and mortals, the way he is presented in Homer, in the Iliad. Okay, so what is wrong with Aeschylus? We mentioned before that the Athenians had this negative experience of, um, of tyranny. And indeed, you can see that reaction towards Zeus because Zeus protects the tyrants and the Pisistratids fostered special relations uh, with Zeus. As soon as the tyranny, as the tyrants fall from, from power, the Athenians <coughs> abandon the construction of the temple of Zeus Olympius at Athens. And every person, every athlete that ever won an Olympic victory, they would consider with suspicion because possibly they harbored tyrannical political ambitions. So, seems, you know, we seem to have a case. I would, though, counter suggest that if we have a closer look both at Prometheus Bound and the reaction of the Athenians to tyranny altogether, we will find inconsistencies to the perfect picture that has been often portrayed in earlier scholarship where we see tyrants, bad, democrats, wonderful. First and foremost, Solon, one of the first people to um, promote democracy at Athens, was an aristocrat himself. By far, the politicians that had protagonistic roles in Athenian democracy were of aristocratic families. The principles that were previously upheld by the tyrants were simply shifted in the democratic context and came to be shared by the whole demos. Not a single person, but a similarly minded group. Does Aeschylus give us any hope 
that this first harsh stage of Zeus's tyranny is ever going to come to anything better? Is it going to improve in any way? I think yes, because at least on three occasions, Prometheus Vincus 764 to 71, 909 to 10, and 974, uh, no, 947 uh, to 8, we have a clear allusion to a Zeus who is settled and even ready to give the power to someone else. Zeus has come to terms with this terrible prophecy that once upon a time someone is going to usurp his throne and he's willing of his own accord to pass it on, to allow the succession story to continue. Now that would be news, certainly because in Prometheus Bound for the most part he is seen as punitive and vindictive toward Prometheus because Prometheus supposedly knows the identity of his usurper, the identity of his successor. So by punishing Prometheus, Zeus hopes that he'll never have to witness